So this is part one of a larger discussion on nuclear strategy and nuclear weapons and the role that they play in foreign policy. So there's a couple different perspectives on how nuclear weapons factor into sort of a, a foreign policy strategy of states. Um, typically we refer to these as mutually assured destruction or MAD, I guess, is the clever acronym, and nuclear utilization theory or NUT, also a clever, I guess, acronym. Um, mutually assured destruction refers to this idea that um, when you have two countries or more that have massive nuclear arsenals, arsenals large enough that they could effectively destroy um, an adversary completely, potentially end life on earth totally, and that both countries have the ability in terms of, of technical capabilities and, and um, logistical capabilities to launch a totally destructive counter-strike then you have this, this situation of mutually assured destruction, right? And it's mutual because both countries have these capabilities. Um, destruction because the, it's the ability to destroy everything. And assured is because of that, that secure second strike capability. The idea that no matter what happens, no matter how much you throw at me, I will always be able to give the order and launch a retaliatory strike. And my retaliatory strike will be overwhelming and devastating and horrific and unsurvivable. And there's no way to avoid that. And when that's in place for both parties, right, then we have mutually assured destruction and nuclear war becomes completely unthinkable, right? It, under those scenarios, there's no way for nuclear war not to end in a global cataclysmic event. And so the only reason to have nuclear weapons is not to, to use them. You, you, you can't use them effectively under a mutually assured destruction system. Um, the reason why you have nuclear weapons is to maintain that system, to ensure that nuclear weapons never get used. In a sense, nuclear weapons are defensive technology. Now, in order to have a mutually assured destruction system, there are some pieces that have to be in place, right? So one of those pieces is detection. You have to be able to see that there is a nuclear strike being launched against you, and you need to be able to pick that up fast enough that you can initiate a counter strike. So that may mean forward radar uh, post so that you can pick up a nuclear launch as soon as it leaves the territory of an adversary. It may mean an intelligence network. It may mean information sharing. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go into uh, an effective detection system. You may want command and control survivability, right? So one of the things that can happen in a nuclear war is that a country can um, launch a nuclear uh, strike into the atmosphere, and that can set off an EMP pulse that sort of fries all the electronic devices in, in the blast range. Um, and that could effectively cut a, a country's ability to communicate. Well, in order to have an effective command and control system that can survive no matter what, you need to shield all of your electronics against that EMP pulse or that EM pulse. Um, so that it's not going to be knocked out. Um, you might want to make sure that your leadership chain of command is, is locked down in such a way that there's no way for a, an adversary to launch a, a strike that could decapitate the state. And so during the Cold War, the United States actually rewrote the Constitution, right? an amendment to the Constitution specifically aimed at articulating what is the long-term chain of command if you know the vast majority of the government is wiped out, who gets to be the person in charge that gets to say, we're launching a retaliatory strike? There were provisions put into the Constitution about what happens when the president is you know, sedated for surgery. What happens if a president is you know, mentally incapacitated and has a stroke? How do you remove a president in those circumstances so that the authority to launch that retaliatory strike is always held by somebody, right? So you have to have command and control survivability um, and then you want to have some mechanism to ensure that your ar nuclear arsenal can't be destroyed all at once in a fell swoop. And so typically that's done through um, a diversification of deployment. Um, that may mean different types of, of um, launch systems, right? So during the Cold War, the United States has relied upon a bomber fleet, right? Where you have long range bombers that are loaded with nuclear weapons and ready to go. And they're always up in the air and ready for the order. Um, submarines that are um, nuclear powered and, and loaded with nuclear ballistic missiles that can pop up on a moment's notice and, and launch a battery of, of nuclear missiles at an adversary. And then land-based um, missiles that are sort of, um, you know, dug into the, into the earth um, all across the upper Midwest and, and the, the West, right? The thinking is that this diversification of 
um, delivery mechanisms means that there's no way for a country to launch a preemptive strike that would destroy all of that simultaneously, right? Even if you got, um, were able to shoot down US bombers, even if you were able to launch a, a, a preemptive strike and uh, wipe out the land-based forces, there's still 20 or so nuclear submarines that can pop up out in the ocean. And there's no way that all of those are going to be destroyed simultaneously in one fell swoop. And so you can do that with um, multiple different types of delivery vehicles or just with submarines that are out and, and diversified in, in locations that would make them hard to find and, and strike. So if you're thinking that the mutually assured destruction is the way to go in terms of nuclear strategy, then there are certain things that you'd want to invest in and work on to make that system as stable and as functional as it possibly can be. So one of the things that you'd want to invest in is your command and control systems, right? So that no matter what happens, you are able to um, launch a retaliatory strike. So there's no way to interdict an order or a command there's no way to prevent that from happening. Um, secondly, you'd want to be very clear about what you can do. So that might mean um, not just shielding your electronics, but bringing in another country and showing them, look, we've shielded our electronics. It cannot be knocked out with an EM pulse. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, it might be, you know, sharing what you're capable of doing in terms of, um, launching missiles, missiles that are launched regularly and, and hit their targets, testing of nuclear weapons to show that our arsenal works, it's reliable, it will function, um, running drills and tests to show that you know, you've got um, the human systems down. Uh, maybe it involves even just you know, bringing in an adversary and showing them your nuclear arsenal, having them fly over the, the missile silos and say, look, there they are. These are real things that you cannot destroy without setting off a, a global nuclear war. So you want to be very clear and transparent about your systems. And then you might want to put in place diplomatic infrastructure to help keep that system in place. And so there were two big initiatives during the Cold War. Um, there were anti-ballistic missile um, agreements that were put in place. And the idea is that... Um, most nuclear weapons are going to be launched through ballistic missiles. An anti-ballistic missile shoots down ballistic missiles. And so these are agreements that would say, we're not going to develop that capability to shoot down incoming ballistic missiles, because if we did that and those systems got sophisticated, I might reach a point where I start thinking, you know, if I launched a preemptive nuclear strike, there'd be a retaliation. Most of it would come in the form of ballistic missiles. I could shoot down 90%, 95% of those a nuclear strike might be survivable, I might be able to win a nuclear war. And as soon as you start thinking in that way, you're moving out of the mad system and into a very dangerous environment where countries might be inclined to use nuclear weapons. Another um, diplomatic supporting PC you might want is to ensure that there is enough of a time window that you can detect and respond um, to a nuclear strike. And so during the Cold War, um, near the end, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to not rely upon intermediate ballistic missiles, but instead intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? The idea that if I'm shooting from one side of the earth to the other, it's going to take 30 to 40 minutes for those missiles to arrive. And that gives the other side time to perceive that they're under attack um, and to decide what to do about it. And then to give the order to launch a retaliatory strike. If you have intermediate range missiles um, that might arrive in, in 10 minutes, that really compresses the window and countries might start thinking, I could launch a preemptive strike and possibly decapitate my adversary um, and prevent them from being able to launch a strike. And that creates a really dangerous situation where maybe we're no longer thinking in terms of mutually assured destruction. So having those kind of agreements in place can make that system more stable. And it's worth pointing out that a mutually assured destruction system is not something that's just guaranteed by nuclear weapons existing, right? Um, if one country has nuclear weapons, mutually assured destruction is not in play, right? When one country has nuclear weapons, it's not just a huge defensive advantage, right? No one would attack me because I could retaliate with nukes, but it's also a huge offensive advantage, right? I can use this as a tool of warfare. I can use this um, to attack my adversaries. And during the, the um, Second World War, the United States had this situation. It was the only country with nuclear weapons and chose to use nuclear weapons to strike at Japan. Um, when you have two countries that have nuclear weapons but don't have this other infrastructure in place, they don't have the secure second strike, they don't have the overwhelming arsenals that are going to ensure you know, cataclysmic destruction from a nuclear war, 
then you're in a situation where maybe the advantage is with the attacker because uh, the attacker can use a good chunk of their arsenal to launch at an adversary to destroy a good chunk of an adversary's arsenal on the ground, limiting an adversary's ability to, to respond, and therefore the advantage tends to be with the country that strikes first. And that's really volatile because as countries get into crises, as they get into these sort of high intensity, high risk situations, they're not holding back, waiting to see what happens. Instead, they're escalating as fast as they can, wanting to be the country that launches first rather than second. That's a dangerous kind of scenario. In addition to that, for mutually assured destruction to work, there's sort of an underlying assumption that the actors involved are rational. It's not just that they had the technical pieces. It's not just that they had the logistical pieces. It's that they actively don't want the end of the world. They're actively seeking to avoid nuclear war. And some folks are skeptical about that. They, they say that you know, human beings are, are flawed, human beings miscalculate frequently, human beings make mistakes. And at some point in time, if nuclear weapons exist, there will be a nuclear exchange. And if that's just sort of taken as given, then maybe we don't wanna think about mutually assured destruction. Maybe we wanna think about how to effectively fight and win and survive a nuclear exchange or a nuclear war. And that leads us into this idea of nuclear utilization theory. And I'll, before I sort of talk about some of the logic of nuclear utilization theory um, and, and, and how to possibly achieve some of these goals, I think it's worth highlighting this stability instability paradox, right? So the idea with mutually assured destruction is that it's obvious to everybody that nuclear war is bad and everybody is seeking to avoid it and, and, and avoid it at all costs. Well, if everybody is seeking to avoid nuclear war at all costs, that sort of puts an upper level on how much escalation there can be toward conflict. And that might create the idea in a country's mind, if I take a provocative action or an aggressive action, if I attack a country, there's not gonna be a retaliation with nuclear weapons because that would be really bad. And I know that, and I know my adversary is gonna be looking for ways to de-escalate. And so I can take these provocative actions without consequences. And so this idea of the stability instability paradox that the, the more confident we are that nuclear war is bad, the more states are gonna be inclined to do things that are gonna to lead to crises that might inadvertently trigger a civil war or not a civil war, a nuclear war um, is part of the reason why nuclear utilization theorists are, are so pessimistic about humanity's long-term ability to avoid a nuclear exchange. So if you're thinking in terms of nuclear utilization uh, theory and, and how to potentially make nuclear war better, I guess, um, you might want to think about how to launch an effective first strike that would overwhelm and eliminate an adversary's ability to retaliate. And so that might mean developing stealth technology. And during the end of the Cold War, the United States was investing in stealth technology. The idea would be that the U.S. could send long-range bombers into the Soviet Union and blow up the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal on the ground and, and wipe out their, their bomber bases and effect, effectively win the, the, nu uh, the uh, nuclear exchange by striking first. And so stealth technology helps to get around the, the problem of detection, um, giving a country an advantage in a nuclear war. Additionally, you could think about how to survive if you're uh, attacked, if, if another country launches against you either first or if they launch a, a retaliatory strike and you're not able to you know, destroy all their arsenal, what do you do about that? Do you shoot down incoming missiles? If that's the case, maybe you need to be investing in anti-ballistic missile systems. Um, maybe you want to disrupt a, a country's ability to retaliate. Maybe that means hacking into their communication networks. Maybe it means a, a decapitation strike against leadership. I'm not sure what that means, but it means trying to figure out how to um, prevent a country from being able to launch against you. Or maybe it just means that you accept that nuclear war is gonna be absolutely devastating for your society and you figure out what life looks like. And so maybe you're investing in underground bunkers where you're growing food underground and the plan is that we'll live underground for 30 to 50 years and wait for the radiation to recede and then emerge and hopefully rebuild civilization. Maybe that's part of winning in a nuclear exchange. So we'll talk more about these um, nuclear utilization theory and, and mutually assured destruction, these perspectives um, as we go through, but I think this is a useful foundation for some of the conversations to come.